We love our children. There is no more important concern for parents than to keep their children safe. We hover and fret and have developed technology that allows parents to keep tabs on children no matter how far away they may roam. Small devices and cameras and microchips and many facets of advanced technological alert systems allow parents, like the shepherds of old, to keep watch over their flock at night. The cribs that my children slept in are deemed no longer safe for their children. I received stern lectures on how virtually everything I provided for them as children signified enormous risk. <laughs> it feels like a miracle that they have somehow survived all the, the booby traps that I had planted while they were <laughs> growing into adolescence. Cradles and other baby paraphernalia which I carefully stored for decades, thinking that one day they would become family heirlooms and provide warm sentiments when grandchildren used the same stuff their parents enjoyed when they themselves were children. But nah, won't happen. <laughs> I would have a garage sale except that no one would pay a nickel for the, the hazardous things that I'm putting out there on the curb. So I will keep them, I will keep them in the hope that the grandchildren in a fit of rebellion against their parents, <laughs> will want to furnish their baby nurseries with all this dangerous paraphernalia that I've kept in storage. I hope so. Actually, I'm fine with all this and have proudly given my newest granddaughter a, a bulletproof stroller, <laughs> which <laughs> folds into a postage stamp and if there's an emergency and you need to, like, it becomes a Hummer. I mean, it's just an amazing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a dangerous world out there. And just like we no longer can, can board an airplane the way we used to, we live in a perpetual state of anxious concern. I no longer quibble with the millennial generation or Generation Xers those who are newly flung into their role as parents. They've got a pretty good beat on what is required these days, at least, I think, a better grip than their baby boomer parents, who still mourn the loss of drug, sex, and rock and roll inside the culture. <laughs> My thoughts this morning, however, extend beyond the, the physical safekeeping of our children to a well, actually to a kind of more fuzzy area pertaining to the emotional well-being of children. Somehow there seems a need for children to feel special in order for them to acquire a healthy self-image. Just like in Lake Wobegon, where all the children are above average, we dedicate our parents' lives, our parenting lives, to making sure that our children feel certainly above average. We are convinced that this elevated sense of self offers a foundation for a strong and healthy ego, leading, of course, then to a successful life. I chose the reading this morning as an example of our culture going to extremes in building the self-esteem in children and making them feel special or at least above average. The reading illustrates how an explosion of trophies for every kid on the team, regardless of talent, demonstrates a, well, a, a, a superficial ego boost, where in fact an accumulation of all those trophies actually can hurt our kids. They represent a, a false reality when compared to the real competitive world of adulthood. And furthermore, as studies show, if everyone receives a trophy, then where's the incentive to perform better? I endured 
one year as a co-basketball coach for junior jazz fourth graders. I wanted to put my best athletes on the floor, but incurred the wrath of parents who wanted to ensure that their clumsy sons had equal playing time. <laughs> the pressure to protect the fragile egos of non-athletic kids forced me into early retirement. <laughs> Just as well. There is no question that we need to nurture the self-worth of our children. And parents ought to encourage their children to find where their strengths lie. But we have two competing interests. Darwin's theories of competition and the survival of the fittest and all that have borne out to be pretty accurate. Just ask any evolutionary biologist. But secondly, there's also a very human fear of our own insignificance, which, as therapists tell us, is a subset of our dread of mortality. Both, this competition and the wondering about our own significance, both reflect the real world. Our delicate nature, questioning our own value and esteem, which must then go out into the world and compete intellectually and physically to arrive at a certain position in life to which we aspire. It's not easy to prepare our children for this, but we may well be, shall we say, overly focused on giving them automatic accolades in order to make them feel really good about themselves. I mean, wow, look at all those trophies on the mantle. Perhaps, perhaps we should move a little more towards rewarding genuine achievement. The tension between self-worth and actual achievement never seems to stop. I remember while still living in Boston, the, the enormous counseling demands placed on Harvard's administrators dealing with the entering class each year. It was not enough just to get admitted into Harvard because the college also offered a freshman seminar program where, for example, a dozen kids or so are selected to have a seminar with Robert Coles or one of the other brilliant people on the faculty there. So for hundreds of students each year not accepted, into a freshman seminar, it meant that for the first time, the very first time in their lives, 17, 18 years old, they felt inadequate. Growing up with the assumption that they were the cream of the crop, they ran smack into a wall of how the world really works and that it is relentlessly competitive. These students who didn't get admitted to the seminars were obviously well above average. Still many students felt completely apart in their first real venture into the world by themselves. They felt lost and hurt, totally alien emotions which they had never experienced before. I happened to find myself in the social company, the social circle with the dean of freshmen at the time, and heard his constant litany of irate parents who felt that Harvard was destroying the confidence of their children, their egos trampled, and their self-esteem, their self-image beyond redemption. And I realize now that those must have been the same parents of my fourth grade basketball team. <laughs> Uh, forever for protecting the fragile core of their children's existence. So you can imagine the shock and the horror when last June, David McCullough Jr., son of the famous historian, and he's an English teacher himself, told the graduating class at Wellesley High School, and I quote, he said to them, you're not special. 
You're not exceptional. The commencement address went viral. <laughs> Obviously, the speech was not intended to be mean-spirited. He felt he needed to inform the seniors, though, that the world would not embrace them as unconditionally as their parents had. He said, just because you've been told you're amazing doesn't mean that you are. <laughs> he advised the students they must prove themselves rather than accept compliments and trophies. For me, the speech culminated in sage advice, advice that these kids would probably never hear from their parents. He told them, climb the mountain, not to plant your flag, but to embrace the challenge, enjoy the air, and behold the view. Climb it so you can see the world, not so that the world can see you. I think that pretty much sums up what we need to tell our children, and I'll be the first to admit how hard that is. Research increasingly shows a rising anxiety among parents as they perceive I think they're right. Opportunities shrinking for their children. Will they get into good colleges, grad schools, top companies? One parent wrote that there just doesn't seem enough room anymore even for the straight A piano playing quarterback. <laughs> and most revealing, she adds, I am convinced that being average will doom our children to a life that will fall far short of what we want for them. What feels problematical in the midst of all this understandable neuroses is a deep-seated fear that an ordinary life points to an unsuccessful life. An ordinary life has become synonymous, it seems, with a meaningless life. Parents operate under the assumption that a healthy self-esteem leads to good colleges, that in turn leads to good jobs, which then spells success. And if a child doesn't believe him or herself to be exceptional, then that child will fall into the ranks of the average and be caught in this self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, I'm just average. 